Hi, good morning from Manila. Um, I'm very happy to welcome everyone to this uh, Asian Impact webinar on uh, the topic, how to stop automotive battery recycling from poisoning our children. So soon after I arrived at ADB to serve as chief economist, I was invited to be a member of a working group on um, uh, lead uh, understanding and mitigating the global burden of lead poisoning organized by the Center for Global Development. And um, it's really remarkable that this issue has not uh, gotten more attention. So a couple of weeks ago during International Lead Poisoning Prevention Week, uh, the working group of uh, CGD released its final statement on, uh, on this topic and really urged uh, everyone to think urgently uh, about making child lead poisoning a top tier development challenge uh, because the more that the data is coming out, the more we're understanding how large of an impact this is having. So as you know, lead uh, is a widely used toxic metal uh, and it has very uh, harmful neurological effects, especially on children, even at relatively low levels of exposure. Uh, it's been estimated that it affects one third of children worldwide, mostly in developing countries it's been estimated that in Asia Pacific, it, uh, the cost of the lost cognitive function of children can cost up to 2% of GDP. And recent research just published this year has also linked lead strongly to cardiovascular disease and premature death, which uh, is as uh, the deaths from lead poisoning actually look to be of similar magnitude to the uh, deaths caused by air pollution. And this costs another 5% of global GDP. Um, so I think we're realizing that this is a really first order issue. Um, and it's really gone under the radar a bit because the, the physical effects of lead are not very obvious. And so it's easy for people not to be aware of the harms. Now, the there are many uses of lead, uh, including in spices, pottery, cookware, cosmetics, but the largest use of lead today, and global lead production and consumption continues to increase, the largest use of lead today is for lead acid battery production because of the growing demand for vehicles, especially in emerging markets and developing countries. And what's particularly challenging about the lead poisoning caused by recycling of these lead batteries is that it's very profitable. Uh, and so when batteries are are, are are being recycled, oftentimes you can really minimize costs by just using manual processes. Uh, but this releases lots of lead pollution into the environment. And so um, at ADB, we've put together a group of people from different departments who are kind of engaging on the lead poisoning issue. And we've commissioned some work and we focused in particular on regulatory approaches to address this uh, poisoning that's occurring through this uh, lead acid battery recycling. And uh, today's webinar is really a product of that work. We also, we commissioned a consultancy report and we just released a policy brief on the issue. And we have a terrific panel today to discuss uh, the topic. Um, and uh, maybe I'll just first introduce our presenter, Ria, and then after she finishes, um, I'm going to, I'll introduce all of the panelists and we'll get into some discussion. So Ria is an associate economics officer at ADB. She has over a decade of experience in research covering a broad range of topics in development economics, including education, labor, social protection, and innovation. She did her PhD um, at Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich through the Max Planck Institute for Tax Law and Public Finance. So Ria, please go ahead and make uh, the opening presentation. Thank you, Albert, and thank you everyone for joining us today. This presentation is based on our ADB brief, co-authored with Russell Hurst, James Baker, and Albert Park. This brief is now available on ADB's website. Lead poisoning is harmful for brain development, especially for younger children whose brains are rapidly forming connections that lay the foundation of the brain architecture. 
A person's intelligence depends on the number of connections between neurons, the basic building blocks of the brain. These connections are formed when signals are transmitted from one neuron to another. In the presence of lead, this transmission is blocked. Thus, lead inhibits the development of a child's full potential. The missed connections translate into difficulties in learning and difficulties in impulse control. As the, as the child grows older, these difficulties result to aggressive behavior, which uh, manifest in higher crime rates. Lead is also harmful for adults. High levels of exposure can cause diseases in the blood, heart, kidneys, and nervous system. Extremely high levels can cause death. Developing Asia is home to about 400 million children who are estimated to have elevated levels of lead in their blood. They are at the levels associated with decreased intelligence and aggressive behavior. About 50% of children in low and lower middle income countries worldwide have elevated blood lead levels, in contrast to about 2% only in high income countries. If the average blood lead level in developing countries were lower down to those of developed countries, the learning gap between rich and poorer nations will have been narrowed by at least 20%. What are the causes of lead pollution these days? Now that lead has been banned from gasoline, lead can still be found in our environment. They, they are found in some lead-based paints, some toys, jewelries, some cosmetics, some low-grade spices like low-grade turmeric, some traditional medicines, um, and but most commonly some aluminum co cookware also. But the most one of the major sources of lead pollution nowadays is unsound unsound practices in recycling lead acid batteries. Lead acid batteries are typically found in automobiles, electric power generators, electric vehicles. Lead acid batteries account for 85% of the lead worldwide. Because of the growing demand for cars, the demand for lead acid batteries has far outgrown the production of lead from mining. Thus, much of the demand for batteries is being met by recycled lead from used lead acid batteries or ULABs. These days, most consumed lead are coming from recycling activities. This recycling industry is worth about $17.5 billion per year. The lead metal trades around $2,000 per ton as of 2021. This is the life cycle of lead acid batteries. Starts with the mining of lead ore, which are then transformed into blocks called lead ingots and later sold to manufacturers of lead acid batteries. The new batteries are distributed by authorized battery distributors and they are sold to car end users. At the end of the battery's life, the end user can either dispose of the battery or send it back to the distributor at the same time they buy a new battery. The distributor can send the used battery forward to a recycling facility. And this recycler recovers lead from the used battery and generates new lead ingots, which are later sold to, to battery manufacturers. In a formal, automated, and closed process of recycling batteries, a hammer mill or shredder breaks down the batteries into its components, plastics, lead materials, and sulfuric acid, which contains dissolved lead. The acid is poured onto containers, distilled from dissolved lead, and either reused as sulfuric acid or neutralized, undergoing wastewater treatment. The solid particles are taken into water filled tanks, which use gravity to separate the components. Lead and heavy metals sink to the bottom of the tank, while plastics float on top of the water. The lead particles are taken to a smelting furnace, which subjects lead to high temperatures until it reaches a liquid state. This furnace is enclosed so that the smoke is contained within the facility. Any fugitive emissions from the, from the furnace are captured by a baghouse or filter plant, which further filters the air 
and subjects it to treatment in order to prevent emissions into the atmosphere. By contrast, traditional informal processes of recycling batteries simply use hammers, axes, or electric saws in breaking down the batteries. The acid is spilled onto the ground containing the dissolved lead. The solid materials are sorted by hand. The recovered lead are taken to an informal smelter, which subjects the, sub, subjects the metal to an open pod on top of a fire. This smelting process releases dark smoke, toxic smoke into the air. The workers typically do not use personal protective equipment, so they are exposed to lead through inhalation and skin contact. There are several pathways of contamination from these traditional crude recycling practices. When, lead, when, when the acid is taken out of the battery, the acid can go into wastewater without undergoing treatment. It can also be absorbed by the ground. And in some cases, it can flow into fields which grow crops. So the food that grow out of these fields contain lead. The manual dismantling and, and sorting process exposes workers to lead through dermal contact and inhalation. The smelting of lead releases dark billows of smoke into the air. And when recycling workers go home without proper protocol like washing or changing clothes, they expose their children, their families to lead. What can we do to protect our children? We propose five interventions. First, everyone needs to know her risk of lead exposure. The public must be made aware of the dangers, sources, and prevalence of lead exposure. Workers and owners of battery recycling, recycling sites must be informed of the risk that come with their occupation. They need to know what they can do to protect themselves, their families, and their communities. The communities near recycling sites must also be informed of the recycling activity. They need to know the dangers of lead exposure and what they can do about it. Safety standards for ULAB recycling must be enforced. Engineering and emissions controls include the use of enclosed furnaces, contained smelting operations, emissions limits, and ample treatment of hazardous wastes. Occupational safety controls include the use of personal protective equipment, limits, of, limits on exposure of workers, and regular monitoring of blood lead levels. Operating permits must be required before anybody can undertake recycling operations. The regulatory body needs to verify that a facility complies with the safety standards before issuing a certificate of compliance, and this certificate must be mandatory. Certification bodies like those for ISO 14001 on environmental management can incorporate the safety standards for ULAB recycling and must check them out before issuing the certificate to a battery manufacturer. Manufacturers must be held responsible for the recycling of used lead acid batteries. In the United Kingdom, battery manufacturers have a take-back obligation. So together, they formed a cooperative scheme for collecting used batteries and transporting them in a proper manner to accredited ULAB smelters. They are allowed to purchase lead ingots from legal smelters only. The reverse logistics system in Brazil requires a one-for-one -one exchange between used batteries and new batteries at every stage of the distribution chain. This ensures that used batteries eventually flow into legal smelters only, who then sell their lead ingots to the manufacturers. The manufacturers form a trade association, which reports to the government the total amount of new batteries sold and the, the, and the total number of used batteries collected every year. This reduces the burden on the government in collecting this type of information. Informed consumers can also have a role to play in encouraging the proper recycling of batteries. If safety seals are to be placed on batteries, this can signal to the consumers that the battery underwent a clean process 
of a clean supply chain that the recycling process it went through um, con complies with the safety standards. Informed consumers will look for the safety seal and buy only batteries containing this seal. A deposit refund system for used batteries can also incentivize consumers to bring their old batteries to certified battery distributors only who will then take the used batteries to accredited recyclers. Finally, it is important that the regulatory and enforcement capacity is strengthened, particularly in developing countries where this is a huge problem. They need better capacity to legislate standards, enforce regulations, monitor compliance, and build effective reporting systems. Financial incentives and penalties can make a difference, and they also need to give clear environmental guidance. Land which has been contaminated with lead due to previous or existing recycling activities will need to be identified, managed, and remediated. That's all. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Leah. Um, so uh, let me introduce our panelists. We're not going to discuss some of the issues related to implementing uh, policies and regulations to address this challenge. And we have a terrific panel. And what's really great about the panel is that they're very diverse. We have representatives of government, academia, non uh, the NGO community, and the business community all here. And they also come from different uh, important countries, uh, Bangladesh, Philippines, Indonesia, and Brazil. Um, and uh, let me introduce them one by one, and then we'll go right to uh, some Q&A. So Amrita Kundu is um, an assistant professor uh, at the McDonough School of Business at Georgetown University. Um, and uh, she does empirical research that looks at ways in which businesses can create social value and improve environmental sustainability. She did a postdoc at Stanford and um, her PhD at the London School of Economics and a master's in environmental systems engineering at Johns Hopkins. Uh, Jerry Geronimo Sanez is the chief of hazard waste management section of the Environmental Management Bureau in the Department of Environment and Natural Resources of the Philippines. Um, he's a chemical engineer by training. His expertise includes chemicals and hazardous waste management, environmental impact assessment, chemical emergency response and preparedness, chemical transport security, pollution prevention and waste minimization, um, and environmental risk um, assessment. Our third speaker is uh, Budi Susulorini. She is the country director of Pure Earth Indonesia, which is the leading uh, global NGO working on the lead issue. Um, they provide support to the government of Indonesia through a combination of research, public education, technical interventions, capacity building, and policy recommendations. She has more than 15 years of experience in program management, particularly in risk mitigation of toxic pollution. And finally, we have Carlos Zaim, who is the Vice President for Corporate Affairs at Clarios, which is a global manufacturer of low voltage vehicle batteries, uh, one of the leading ones globally, and he's based in Brazil. Carlos has vast experience in corporate affairs and a demonstrated history of working as CEO in the mechanical and industrial engineering industry. So with that, I want to start with uh, a general question for each of our panelists, and that is um, to give some uh, a better kind of local context to the to the challenge and the responses. I'd like each of you to describe the nature and extent of the problem of informal battery recycling in, in your country of expertise, and in particular, what is the government doing to address the issue? Uh, so maybe we can start with um, Jerry, and then we'll go Hi. to Amrita and Budi. Yeah. Yes. Um, good morning, everyone. So uh, greetings from the um, mid-Central Philippines here in Negros one of the islands of the Philippines. So um, with regard to uh, battery recycling here in the Philippines, um, I think um, we have a uh, loss in place, but what we are addressing right now are the, am I audible? Yes. 
You're good. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I thought um, I'm not audible. Um, our uh, challenge now and um, what we are uh, what we are uh, focusing is uh, when the battery is uh, reused lead acid battery is generated from the households. So from the community, and that's where informal uh, recycling um, is uh, is done. But uh, uh, there's not much um, informal uh, recycling in the Philippines. But uh, rather, there are um, there are uh, we, we have a certified bias or certified um, secondary lead smelter here in the Philippines that um, introduced since 2013 or more than 30 years ago that uh, the concept of EPR uh, has been um, perfectly. Um, perfectly uh well near perfect implemented here in the Philippines and we have worked with um with uh, a foundation uh, through a public private partnership it's just like we have launched um the bantai bateria with uh the biggest network here in the Philippines that we call. bantai bateria is guard the battery bantai is guard in in Filipino language and we have an intensive um intensive um program uh, to, to say that uh, don't just throw away your battery and these are the toxic components of the battery and how can you be of help in uh, to the community. So uh, the battery manufacturer here in the Philippines um, is uh, already um, implementing um, the uh, EPR that uh, if uh, you, ha you have problem with your battery, uh, either you, uh, if that will be uh, not uh, returned to the uh, to the dealer, then that will be your responsibility to uh, properly um, properly dispose of it through a uh, well a registration procedure or permitting procedure that we are requiring here in the uh, in the Philippines. But if you will be surrendering the um, the uh, the battery, the useless acid battery, the battery uh, manufacturer will be uh, providing you a rebate. Uh, a discount to your new battery, and they will be uh, they will take the battery for proper recycling in their facility. So that is the situation here in the Philippines. But still, uh, there's no perfect uh, implementation. But uh, we are addressing now the uh, the informal a little. Uh, there's a little something um, in, in in some communities that we need to address battery informal battery recycling i will not say that uh, there's no informal uh, battery recycling here in the philippines but we are addressing it currently uh, here in the philippines with regard to policy um, we have uh, since 2013 and we uh, since 2004 uh, we have issued uh, policies and um, even a specific for lead and lead compounds that uh, includes the, the control on the um, on the disposal or in the environmental sound management of um, of uh, lead acid batteries, e including other sources of lead, uh, lead intake, um, and we are uh, well. I'm proud to say that uh, the Philippines has been uh, recognized by um, GAEL or the Global Alliance for Elimination of Lead Intake by issuing the policy, the chemical control order for lead and lead compounds that reduces the level of lead intake. But uh, be that as it may, uh, prior to the issuance of lead and lead compounds, uh, CCO, we have been, um, well, this uh, Bantai Bateria program and the, uh, the rules and regulation for hazardous waste management has been in place since 1992, enhanced in 2004, and further enhanced in 2013. And uh, by next year, we have a further enhancement on the classification where lead will be sourced uh, from solder dross, from battery, from other sources of uh, lead. So that is the situation right now here in the Philippines. In terms of policy and in terms of government act activities and uh, work with a civil society. And um, before uh, we have closely worked with your earth before, uh, prior to blacksmith um, regarding the um, contaminated sites management. And that is uh, well uh, included in our contaminated sites guidelines uh, that um, initially focus on persistent organic pollutants, but there are some other levels or standards uh, guidance, and that is a, uh, serves as a guidance document in uh, assessing uh, characterization, remediation, and site control in relation to uh, contaminated sites management. And that will be all for this uh, morning. Uh, I hope that I'm not speaking too fast, and then I have shared 
what are the Philippine experience and what we are doing here in the Philippines. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you so much. Uh, let's now turn it over to Amrita uh, and maybe she can uh, fill us in on the situation in Bangladesh. Thank you so much, Albert. And uh, thank you so much, Jerry. It was really interesting to hear about Philippines journey. Um, um, it's a pleasure to be here and to share my research and my understanding of the lead and battery market in Bangladesh that um, I have been studying with my co-authors, Erica Plambeck and Sean Wong uh, from U.S. universities as well uh, for the last three, four years. So the major problem of lead poisoning in Bangladesh is stemming from batteries that are used in electric three-wheelers. So when I say electric three-wheelers, you can think about the rickshaws or the tuk-tuks that used to be manually operated earlier, and now they have been fitted with batteries and uh, mainly lead acid batteries. So the number of these electric vehicles have rapidly increased in Asia, including in India, China, Bangladesh. So Bangladesh has about 3 million of these electric three-wheelers that operates. Um, and turns out that it's larger than the total number of Teslas worldwide. So it's really a large sector and a completely uh, unregulated and informal sector. Now these vehicles, like I said, use lead acid battery. Lithium penetration in this segment is negligible. Uh, but unlike car batteries, where you have in one car battery, uh, which is a starter battery, uh, uses about 10 kilos of lead versus an electric three-wheeler uses deep cycle lead acid batteries, and these are massive batteries. So one vehicle will run on about 120 kilos of lead, so 12 times as much. The life of these batteries in Bangladesh is appallingly poor. The, the uh, vehicle owners have to replace their batteries once in every year. So you, we are talking about 3 million vehicles that are running on lead acid batteries that have 120 kilos of lead that is being recycled every year. So it's our back of the envelope calculation suggests about 200,000 metric tons of lead that is being recycled in Bangladesh. So it is a really large uh, industry. And Albert, like you said, it's also a highly profitable industry. Now, 5 to 20% of that lead is lost in recycling because of the improper and informal ways in which it's currently being recycled in Bangladesh. Um, so Bangladesh has some regulation around battery handling and recycling. In 2006, they had this legislation which uh, was meant to ensure that only Department of Environment certified facilities can recycle lead acid batteries. But we, we know from our own work and other studies in Bangladesh that uh, the regulatory capacity is not being able to identify a lot of these small facilities because they're really small, they're discrete, they're in remote locations and uh, they are highly mobile. So if you catch one, they can move on to a new location and start the operation again. So we know that majority of the lead in Bangladesh um, is being recycled informally. Now, early 2000s, uh, the World Bank and other development agencies were building uh, programs around solar adoption, and they helped Bangladesh to build capacity around formal uh, smelting of lead acid batteries. So through low interest loans, uh, there is fixed capacity available in the country for smelting lead acid batteries formally. But what we find from our research is that this capacity is not being used. And the reason that these capacity, the formal smelting capacity is not being used is, is because of the high operating costs faced by the formal recyclers compared to the informal recyclers. And so these cost differentials are in the high energy costs. So the cost of coal is much cheaper uh, than the cost of uh, electricity or natural gas. Then there is the high regulatory costs on the formal smelting facilities where they have to comply with the policies. There's a lot of bureaucratic processes involved, as well as they have to use the air treatment plant and the effluent treatment plants, which are also energy consuming. And then the third aspect of it is the high taxes or the presence of taxes for the formal uh, recyclers versus no taxes for the informal recyclers. So what we have found is that because of these high operating costs faced by the formal uh, smelters or the formal recyclers, two things are happening in Bangladesh. 
One is that the formal sector is not being competitive uh, or not able to pay competitive prices in buying the used lead asset batteries from the scrappers and the, and the middlemen. So all consumers in this segment are returning the batteries because the salvage value in Bangladesh is really high, about 40% of the new battery price you can get back as the, the salvage value at the end of its life. But the, uh, the formal smelters are not being able to buy these batteries from the middlemen because they're not being able to give a high price for these used batteries. So as a result, these batteries are moving into the informal channel. And the second thing that's happening is to reduce their own costs, the formal smelting facilities are informally, illegally um, engaging in the practices of subcontracting or illegal sourcing of the smelted lead from informal sector. So even though they're able to buy back the, the used batteries, they're still preferring to buy the smelted lead from the informal sector because of the uh, cost differential. So that's our understanding of the market. Thanks, Albert. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Budi, maybe you can say a few words about Indonesia. Thank you, Albert. Good morning, everyone. So I'm, it's a pleasure for me to be here to share about um, information that we have in Indonesia, which is more or less um, similar to what has already explained by Jerry and also Amrita. So in Indonesia, unfortunately, we have no official data regarding the volume of um, ULEP and the number of informal um, recyclers. But we have an estimate that more than 50% of the total volume of ULEP is processed in informal recyclers. In Indonesia itself, there are only four licensed ULEP recyclers and they are all in Java. And the number of informal recyclers, unfortunately, is outnumber um, these um, licensed um, recyclers. And our observation over the years has um, shown that there are bigger um, informal informal recyclers who has the capacity to uh, operate uh, continuously, but there are also smaller ones that operate only when there is a supply. Their locations are um, scattered, and but there are, we also found some um, recyclers that are gathered in one location, but they are all work alone and not in groups. Um, Similar to what happened um, in the Philippines and also in Bangladesh, and it is already explained by Ria also, that in these informal smelters, workers uh, do not wear a PPA, PPE and the businesses, uh, the businesses is run uh, not in compliance with the environmental standard. The latest data that we have is when we did the toxic site identification program or um, TSIP in 2021 to 2022, uh, together with the 10 November Institute of Technology Surabaya or ITS, we assessed 67 locations in Java and 85% are re related to ULEP, ULEP recycling. And we use portable X-ray fluorescent uh, to measure lead concentration in soil. And we found that 63% of these total 67 um, locations are contaminated with lead. Together with ITS, we also went to another uh, main island in uh, Indonesia, uh, which is called um, Sumatra Island, and we assessed 28 locations, and we found um, informal uh, ULEP recycles in North Su Sumatra, and uh, we also identified that um, there, there were ULEP um, collectors in other provinces in Sumatra, but they sent all the ULEP that they collected to Java Island for um, recycling. So we can say that Java has a lot of environmental burden. In regards to what uh, the government of Indonesia has already done to address this issue, actually, they have done like a various um, um, efforts, including um, arresting uh, business actors and closing informal recycling. However, uh, business actors were back to business when they left prison and some moved their businesses just like Amrita said to more remote uh, locations to continue um, their businesses. But recently in Indonesia, uh, there has been e issuance of um, regulations 
concerning management of specific waste. So this is ULEP from the household. Extended producer responsibility and the local governments can set up hazardous waste collection, including for ULEP. So in consider uh, to co considering the real impact on environment and health, especially children, the government of Indonesia may consider to move forward with capacity building and strict enforcement for this sector. So for example, Ministry of Environment and Forestry and the government of Jombang Regency in East Java have adopted a comprehensive approach that can be used as a model. The government relocated uh, small-scale metal smelters into one location with facilities which have been installed in compliance with the environmental standards, formalized the smelters through forming a cooperative and provided coaching, clean up contaminated sites, and do enforcement to those who continue working illegally. Back to you, Albert. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, for sharing the experience in Indonesia. And finally, let me turn it to turn it over to Carlos. Do you want to say a few words about uh, the current situation in Brazil? Um, I can say that uh, more than 15 years, we do not have any specific problem with lead contamination in Brazil caused by battery production cycle. Today, the figure of the informal recycle was almost eliminated in Brazil. Formal and automatic smelters currently hold more than 98% of the recycling market, okay? Uh, the Brazilian government created specific legislation that helped in combating not controlled this, uh, recycling besides safety standards. The main point is that the legislation create uh, conditions for the legal manufacturers have advantage to control the complete recycle cycle. Okay, then this, uh, this uh, legal manufacturers only buy from legal smelters, then there's a virtual circle. Okay, uh, what, what the government uh, they have done in Brazil uh, first of all, they make the producer, the product manufacturer, a uh, hundred percent responsible for reverse logistics collection at a rate of one kilogram per one kilogram of sold batteries. Okay, uh, eliminate smelter from this role. There is no responsibility for these melters, only for the manufacturers. Okay, the manufacturers have to hire the service from the smelters to transform spent batteries in lingots to enter again in the cycle of production, okay? Uh, as the responsible uh, manufacturer, it's possible to have a, a complete closed loop control of the reverse logistic. Without transforming the used battery in a commodity, subject to purchase and sale. We can say that more than 80, 85% of the junk or the spent batteries that uh, are used in the battery producer in Brazil are not buy. They we, we do not buy these batteries, we receive back. For instance, Eclarius only sell a battery to the, his, this, its distributor, if you receive another one back. This is mandatory by contract, okay? Uh, other point, the, the government eliminated the possibility that any legal barriers among the states could be creating uh, problems to move the batteries around the, the country. It would be impossible, it would be impossible for the manufacturers to have this big chain. Imagine that Brazil is a very big country and uh, uh, we receive batteries from, uh, from all the country, okay? If we have specific legislation or barriers among the states, it will be very difficult to receive the batteries back uh, in our uh, des designed smelters, okay? Uh, the other point, very important, is uh, eliminating any tax on spent batteries. Tax evasion on spent batteries is the greatest weapon used to, by clandestine smelters to be competitive in the market. Okay, 
they have can uh, they can have lower costs when they do the things manually, but the biggest smelters they have the volume to compensate it. The biggest problem in country like ours, I imagine, are taxes, avoiding taxes. Then uh, this make uh, the illegal smelters competitive. If you eliminate the tax over over uh, the spent batteries, we transform completely uh, the situation. Okay. Uh, the the fourth step, the government uh, forced the Brazilian manufacturers to create a private entity to control the flow of the, the spent batteries and the new batteries in the country, okay? And sent to the government quarterly reports. Now, for the next year, we will enter in the last phase of the program where all new batteries sold in the market and all old battery received in the smelters will be cross-checked through electronic invoices. Okay, we are preparing the, the system now to create the situation. Then what I can tell, uh, for countries that wish to implement the system, the biggest change, uh, the, the big challenge is to convince the states that they must comply with a central regulation in a case in cases like countries like ours that are very big and the central government that they have to eliminate tax over spent batteries. This is not easy, I know, because I did this, uh, this thing personally, uh, but when you convince them that this will solve the problem of lead contamination, uh, they will be at your side. Uh, I think this is the uh, what we have done in Brazil to, to be in the situation that we have now. Great. Thanks. I think Brazil's experience is is really an important uh, one for countries in Asia to learn from. Um, okay, let me. Uh, I mean, it's it's very fascinating to me because we have, I think, broadly speaking, you know, two very positive cases of Brazil and the Philippines, where it seems like there's a confidence that um, the informal. Uh, recycling of these batteries is not a huge problem. It's still, you know, out there as a as a challenge. But then we have um, in Bangladesh and Indonesia, and also in Vietnam, where you know we had also commissioned some uh, some research. Still, a very high market share of the informal batteries, and uh, so maybe we can um, try to get more insight into this. I, I, I'm wondering if um, it's not just kind of something about how much resources you have in enforcement. <laughs> Is that enough? And so I am curious for all of the countries, especially in Philippines and Brazil, how much government staff effort time, you know, is really spent, and maybe that's viewed as a constraint in other other countries. Um, but let me go around. Let me go back to Jerry and ask you. You know, what what do you think has made the Philippine program so successful? In particular. Um, I mean, was the and I guess this is also true for Brazil. Was there an informal informality problem before all of these regulations? And also, you know, why isn't there still this incentive for a um, a recycler to kind of subcontract out to informal recyclers just to save cost? You know, you know how 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 much enforcement do you really need to prevent kind of uh, various uh, informal kind of evasions of of the regulations. Yeah, with, with regard to the Philippines, um, we we have sixteen regions, and we have um, a, a equally competent and trained uh, enforcers uh, to do some monitoring and um, monitoring of the, uh, the activities and uh, enforcement of the uh, of the law. So what I'm trying to, uh, what we're enhancing right now are the uh, our promotion of uh, well raising the awareness to of uh, people, especially in the community. Um, it's no longer the main source of uh, illegal activities are when uh, people um, uh, think that they can still recover or 
they, they will just be uh, there will be some um some cart uh, buyers let's say uh, we call it cariton so they are junk shops buying a uh, used lead acid batteries and they 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 them themselves are recycling informally and um that is a uh, uh, in the community but uh, in terms of um in terms of the industrial generation that's not really uh, much of a problem and um we are now closely working with the department of energy because of the energy um the e vehicle program here in the philippines and uh, the strengthening of the um, connectivity in the philippines that uh, we know very well that um mobile uh the mobile uh, mobile phone cell sites or the sites are equipped with huge lead acid battery for as a source of uninterruptible power supply to, not to uh, disrupt the uh, the inter uh, the connectivity here in the philippines but um regarding hey i think uh jerry got cut off okay maybe uh, carlos do you want to chime in um we only have uh maybe 13 minutes left in the seminar. So maybe we can try to be somewhat brief so we can get to a few of the questions. But do you want to comment on kind of the enforcement requirements needed to implement the Brazilian system? Or is it more about just the incentives being smart? Or is there also, does it require a lot of uh, capacity? No, as a matter of fact, the government does not uh, have a big, uh, you say, uh, capacity to go to the to the companies and uh, verify what's happening. As a matter of fact, uh, we have some very uh, established system for license to smelter to operate. Okay, and the smelters that operate legally, they have to follow these uh, these uh, conditions. The biggest problem that we had in the past is that doesn't matter if you have a lot of uh, regulations if the smelter is completely illegal, okay? They're, they don't care about it. And uh, it's very difficult to the government uh, to go to very small spots in Brazil, in the interior, and, uh, and uh, does not sometimes worthwhile all the, all the work to do this, uh, comparing with the amount of uh, uh, workers that they have in the government, okay? The point is, uh, According to our experience, okay, when you eliminate taxes over the spent batteries, uh, the automatic system worth more than not automatic system. And in spite of the investment that you have to do and so on, in short period of time, the return on investment is much higher, okay, uh, basically. And automatically, this not uh, legal smelters disappear, including because the biggest companies will not buy from them. And it does not worthwhile for the big smelters to use sm small and no legal smelters if they have to sell everything with uh, invoice and uh, the difference in the taxes not deducted in the cost of the final product. Uh, this is our experience, at least working very well in Brazil. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, maybe I can turn it to Amriti, Amrita. Um, I think Carlos is suggesting that the key is to get the market incentives right so that in his in the Brazil economy, it's actually not competitive for the informal uh, 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 recyclers to uh to in terms of the purchasers to to buy from them so i'm curious if you had any thoughts on market-based solutions and do you think something like that could work in bangladesh or do you think there are different issues that would make it harder thanks albert and a uh, very interesting uh case study in brazil so i think as i'm hearing it i'm trying to think what are the differences between a, a country like bangladesh versus you know how brazil or philippines has been so successful so one that I have understood is that the recycling sector, the informal recycling sector in Bangladesh is larger and more organized than just small scrappers running this business. It is, uh, there seems to be more uh, collaboration among the different larger smelters as well. They may have the formal facilities, but they are also engaging in um, working with the informal sector. And the other thing that comes to mind is 
just the regulatory enforcement capacity, it seems to me in Bangladesh uh, is weaker. Digitization um, has not necessarily uh, been uh, uh, dramatic in the country. So I think that reduces, that makes it harder to uh, observe the whether the regulations are being followed or not, including tax payments and so on. So we have been thinking about, you know, how do we again make it the level playing field as Carlos becomes economic to formally recycle than to informally recycle. So we have been thinking about uh, the working capital constraints. Like I said, in Bangladesh, there is fixed capital, but the, the, the capacity utilization is low. So we've been thinking about could low interest rate working capital loans be helpful, maybe through green financing schemes by the government? And could there be tax incentives and maybe even energy subsidies? But that is linked to the uh, amount of formal lead that is recycled. So the incentive is associated with the volume that is uh, actually formally recycled uh, so as to reduce perverse incentives where the formal recyclers are actually not even um, smelting. But then to actually be able to trace the batteries and the, the lead, I think that's where we're still figuring out and very happy to kind of brainstorm together on, on what the uh, exact solutions could be. I would touch upon one other thing, Albert, and that is while we do need to have this proper channel, the reverse logistics sorted out, I think what is also very important in these markets, especially for the electric three-wheelers in Bangladesh, is to ensure that the, there is a better market for high-quality batteries. Because if you have batteries with really short life, then the rate of recycling is really high. So if we can improve the product quality in this market, which is something that we're also looking into as to how to build business models and bring together financing for higher quality batteries for these low income customers, uh, I think that will also reduce the, the rate of recycling and therefore the rate of emissions. And finally, uh, Budi, do you wanna say a few words? Um... I mean, you're you. One thing that you mentioned doing is trying to find these uh, informal sites, which I guess if the government was trying to regulate them in a direct way, they'd have the same challenge that you have had. So I'm curious, uh, you know, whether it's even possible to find uh, these informal sites, if even if you wanted to. But I'm also curious how you react to kind of the Brazil and Philippine examples, and whether you think uh, it's feasible to do something similar. I mean, one thing for everybody that struck me that could be different from Brazil and uh, some of these other countries in Asia is that it, the informal recycling might be even more profitable relative to formal in these countries when the wages are are lower, um, et cetera. And it, so I'm not sure if just uh, making the tax field level make, is enough to make the uh, informal operations non-competitive, but I think it's an interesting um, issue to think about, and, and it would be relevant also to think about that in the in, in the Philippine context as well. Uh, Budi? Okay, thank you, Albert. So when it comes to informal ULAP smelters, yes, it is very challenging to identify once because the information is limited. As Amrita said that it is informal, it is discreet. So what we have been uh, done is try to look for um, information from various sources, including information that we can find from the available, uh, which is available online, report from the community, and also information from our uh, network. Once we get the information, another challenge that uh, we have been facing is to get into the site and collect necessary information. So when in 2022, when we expanded the scope of our toxic site identification program, not only in Java, but also to go to Sumatra, we are facing another challenge, which is a distance and, all, uh, and cultural differences. And when we went uh, to the sites or to the locations, local stakeholders do not know about ULAP and its impact. But despite all those challenges, we were able to collect data, uh, which then we contributed to the Ministry of Environment and Forestry to be added into the database of identification and inventory, which they use as a reference to determine the national priority list for remediation of hazardous waste contaminated sites in Indonesia. And lately, with funding from Clarios Foundation, we have been providing support to the government of Bogor and Tegal Regencies in Java Island to prepare documents needed to remediate uh, lead contaminated sites uh, due to informal ULAP recycling. 
and integral in Central Java. Uh, Ministry of Environment and Forestry has already cleaned up the dump site and the regional environmental agency will start cleaning up remaining contaminated so soil in home yard and alleys. And after remediation, the government plans to transform the site into a religious tourist destination to utilize the local potential and bring better opportunity to the community. So uh, in Indonesia, and I think it is also similar to in other countries that remediation process is long and expensive and it requires multi-stakeholders collaboration and coordination to implement it in a comprehensive way. So therefore, it would be better if you let recycling activities are managed well to prevent pollution. And this webinar also uh, is a good opportunity for me to know that there is some uh, models in Brazil and also in, in the Philippines that we can uh, look up that maybe some condition that uh, may be compatible in Indonesia that can also be adopted in Indonesia. Back to you, Albert. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. So uh, we just have a few minutes left. We do have some questions in the Q&A. Actually, we also have quite a, a few comments. Uh, describing the situation in Mongolia where batteries are often used in by nomadic groups for uh, their own electric electricity supply, not for cars. Um, but uh, one question that was raised here is, you know, some of the lead is not recycled. And is there a way to dispose of such lead in a safe way? Or what happens to, to that lead? Or is that all very kind of polluting lead? I don't know if anyone has any thoughts about any of our panelists have any thoughts about that. And then um, I think uh, another question uh, that's raised is, can we, I mean, can we just use penalties, punishments, and rewards to enforce proper recycling? Um, it strikes me that's very an, a very enforcement-intensive approach. And I don't know if that's actually important in the Philippines and in Brazil, where you know they've been more effective. Uh, so maybe I can um, turn that over to any. Does, do any of the panelists want to say anything about how lead is disposed when it's not recycled, or is it is it pretty much all recycled in your various contexts? If you want to say anything, just unmute and speak up. It's all it's all recycled. Uh, the point is uh, that the recycling process. They, we have a final, we have a final residues that we, we have to give the appropriate destination for this. Usually you, uh, you, you create, uh, we, we call swimming pools with plastic and we put this and the cover with land and so on, uh, according to the legislation that we have here. Okay. They, right. they scrap of the right. process. And Jerry, do you want to say anything about penalties? Are there like fines or other financial penalties that are imposed on, on people? Or is that not really an issue? It's not really necessary. Well, um, with regard to fines and penalties, it's already in the um, in our written regulation. But um, there are two laws that um, we are um, coordinating or dovetailing our activity. Um, the, uh, when we see that um, the waste is generated from the community, so um, they are uh, our current law, which is the Republic Act 6969, is on the industrial hazardous waste generation. And what we are now addressing, as I mentioned earlier, is that when the hazardous waste are generated from the community, and um, especially like uh, if I have a useless acid batteries at home, so how, how do I dispose of it? So. There's a ecological solid waste management act that regulates, um, and the uh, local government unit is the one mandated to uh, enforce. And we are closely working with the with the um, uh, local government units by enhancing and further uh, uh, in the the operation of their materials recovery facility. That um, all hazardous waste from communities uh, from the residences should be brought, and this this um generator should pay the should pay the uh, the local government for the disposal it is happening in one of the cities in national capital region which is maritima city that um when uh when a household is disposing of uh there has a household hazardous waste like busted fluorescent lamps used oil 
use baseball oil, they need to pay the city for the disposal. And that should be directed to the materials recovery facility. And that is the focus um, of activities that we're doing right now here in the Philippines. Um, with regard to the informal thing, uh, some big uh, informal things that I'm um, do, uh, currently doing because of, uh, well, it has been enhanced or um, emphasized by Amita about the taxes and about the um, the uh, the price of uh, lead uh, outside the, the mar uh, in the international market. So some are really big industries, but we are penalizing it. Uh, we have penalty provision in the uh, industry operating without uh, in environmental permits in the Philippines. Great. Thank, thank you so much. So we're out of time, but I think uh, from the discussion, obviously this is a complex issue. We're really kind of just scratching the surface in the discussion, but I think we can see some of the elements of uh, effective policy responses and regulations. And there's issues about really thinking about incentives, market incentives, but also what is the regulatory apparatus that's that's needed. And um, I think we need to follow up and provide more detail on the lessons uh, so that countries that still have a high level of informal uh, lead acid recycling um, uh, can learn. Um, and uh, so I want to just end by thanking all of our panelists for their excellent contributions. It was a really fascinating discussion uh, for us and will help us, I think, take this agenda forward. So thank you, everyone, and thanks for attending. Yeah, thank you, Albert. Uh, thank it's you. our pleasure to be part of this uh, webinar. And Bye. let me definitely uh, pitch you. our next Asian Impact webinar. The details are on your screen. It's on promoting small firms for resilient gender balanced growth in the Pacific.